I want to thank everybody for coming. My name is Dan Martin, and I'm with the New Lenox Police Department, and I also chair our Safe Communities America Coalition, who's sponsoring this event tonight in partnership with many of our Safe Community members. Uh, I just want to do a couple housekeeping things. If you guys would be so kind in uh, respect for our speakers tonight, if you guys could just silence your cell phones, that would be great. Uh, anyone that needs to use the washroom, they're right outside those doors. The men's is right to the left, and the ladies is right across the hall. There's also a drinking fountain, and we also have water here in the room. Um, so help yourself. Uh, again, thank you on behalf of the village and our Safe Communities Coalition for you guys coming out tonight. And with that, I'd like to introduce Mayor Tim Balderman, who's going to provide our opening remarks for this evening. Thank you. Thank you all for being here. Uh, of course, I want to say a big thanks to Dan Martin and Safe Communities. They've done such a tremendous job over the last few years. Uh, I was just speaking earlier that every time we turn around, there's something new going on that, uh, that they're working on here to help our community be safer. And so uh, I'd like to give Dan and his group a hand. I know you'll get to find out who all the people were that were involved tonight. Rachel, Rose Prance, everybody that you, uh, Rachel from Rose Prance, everyone that you've uh, brought out here. We certainly say thank you for your efforts. Uh, this is an important topic. It's one I think that uh, really hasn't been addressed. I haven't seen addressed in this type of forum. Uh, you know, in New Lenox, uh, we don't bury our head in the sand. Uh, we were one of the first ones to have a heroin forum. Uh, when the heroin epidemic started hitting the area. And even though at that time, we didn't have a major problem with it, we knew it was on the horizon for every community, so we wanted to talk about it up front. Uh, this is something uh, that I am familiar with. As 22 years as a police officer, uh, I saw many kids uh, that had easy access to pres uh, prescription painkillers and other types of controlled substances. Uh, some of them didn't want to go out and, um, you know, try and buy heroin or buy something else, or they weren't interested in that at first, but it was easily accessible to, to get and to take, and uh, didn't always start with an injury. You know, sometimes it was just, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take this. It's in, in the medicine chest at home. And uh, you see it happens uh, uh, to all people in all walks of life, in all communities. Uh, this is not something that just affects uh, people in lower social economic areas. It affects everybody, and we need to all be aware of it. Uh, it's a difficult thing. Somebody, myself, who has gone through uh, a number of, of surgeries, painful surgeries, uh, back fusions and torn labrums and those sorts of things, where you need to take these pain pills, uh, and then you find, you know, these, this is good. It's, it's really relieved that pain. But you have to get off them quickly, and it's a difficult thing to do. But I'm certainly not the expert here to speak on it tonight. I'm really here just to welcome all of you, thank everyone that's responsible for putting this together, and for all of you for coming out, because what we, we, what we rely on as a village is that you're going to spread the word on what you learn. Uh, we know you're all busy. You took time out of your busy lives to come here tonight. Not everybody can get here. Uh, we do film this so people can watch it on Channel 6, but we know that you're going to share that information with others. So thank you for being committed to helping New Lenox be the great community that it is. So have a great night. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And now I'd like to introduce Arnie Pilmonis. He's from AVP Counseling here in New Lenox. Uh, he's also a partner with Safe Communities here in New Lenox. And he's also the chair of our Poisoning by Prescription Drug Overdose Task Group. Hi, everybody. Thanks for coming out. Uh, as he said, I'm uh, the head of the task group for poisoning by prescription drug overdose, and it's a pretty complex problem. You know, it's uh, it can lead to addic addiction, drug abuse by teenagers and by by adults. Uh, what we try to do, set a goal uh, for the task group here, is just a simple one that uh, everybody can participate in. If you have any prescription drugs at home, or even over-the-counter drugs things you haven't used in years, or uh, maybe your parents have it, or that, get rid of it. If you don't use it, get rid of it. Uh, New Lenox Police Department has a box. As soon as you walk in the door, it looks like a mailbox. And uh, you can put your old prescriptions in there and uh, get rid of them safely. 
because uh, there really is no other safe way to get rid of them. You can flush them down the toilet, but then they eventually get, end up in the water in the, in the system. You put them in landfills and the same thing happens. And uh, this is a safe way to do it. Uh, by chance, we're doing this at the same time that uh, it's uh, National Drug Take Back Day on Saturday. And I looked it up online, and they mentioned uh, Mokina, they mentioned uh, Will County, Lockport, and they didn't have New Lenox on there. So I want you to know New Lenox has uh, a drop box for your medications. Uh, again, there's a lot of things that can happen with uh, an overabundance of medications out there. It seems like they're getting more and more popular. You have commercials on TV form, and uh, as the mayor said, uh, you get a touch of the opiates, and if you like them, you know, uh, they get expensive after a while and you move to something cheaper like a heroin, which is cheap when you start off with, but uh, if you get hooked on it, uh, it gets very expensive. And there's other medications besides that. There's Xanax and uh, sedatives, um, uh, antidepressants, uh, blood pressure pills, the whole <laughs> gamut. And uh, you can bring your, your medications even over the counters and topical creams and things like that, you get rid of them at the New Lenox Police Department. Uh, we're gonna see a movie here, and Rachel's from uh, Rosecrans, which is a, a treatment center, and uh, she'll tell you more. Hello, everybody. Thanks for coming out tonight. So I'm just gonna give you a lay of the land of how tonight's gonna work. First of all, I just wanna welcome you all, and second of all, I wanna say the landscape has changed. When I was a kid growing up, as I watched the drug commercials, the Just Say No campaign, they kind of showed this creepy guy that looked like the drug dealer on the street corner, and they said, just say no and run. Well, if you've seen today, the commercials are saying, check your medicine cabinet. The landscape has changed. After marijuana use, prescription drugs has now the next biggest thing on our hands. It has now surpassed car fatalities. So the landscape has changed, and we need to be educated. Um, I am the community relations coordinator at Rosecrans, and prior to that, I was a primary counselor um, with a local hospital and I worked for over five years on an addiction unit. So I worked very, very closely with people with addictions and the prescription drugs are on the rise. So what my heart and passion as I've joined with uh, Dan and Safe Communities is to get people educated because you don't know what you don't know. And there's a lot of times when, you're, when you get caught up in addiction, it's no longer you, that addiction is now taking over. And it'll do whatever it needs to do, lie, cheat, and steal, to get fed. And a lot of times, um, family members, you don't know what you don't know. And so you think the lesser of two evils. Well, at least it's not heroin, and it's a prescription, so maybe it's not as bad. So my heart is to educate family members so that you know. What we know about addiction is it's a family disease. And we all have to become educated because we all get sick in the process. So I want to... We're going to show an 11-minute video that's going to show five families and their personal true stories of what they walk through with their teens in particular. Then we're going to have um, a couple of action points that I'm going to talk to you tonight about. You have a sheet with those action points, a real quick take home. And then third, we're going to have Michelle share her personal story with prescription pills. And what I'm really excited about as well is that we have Dr. Singula here tonight, and he is from... Clinical Associates in Medicine, which is in Joliet. And what's unique about Dr. Singla is he's not only an MD, but he and Dr. Gouda, and I will say Dr. Gouda is on the form. He could not come tonight, so his partner came in crime. Um, they both are uniquely trained in addiction medicine. Together, they have over 30 years of clinical experience caring for those with addictions, both chemical, whether it's alcohol or drugs, as well as behavioral gambling, internet addiction. Uh, they're considered experts in the diagnosis, treatment, and maintenance of addiction-free states. Their unique blend of primary care with addictions allowed their practice to become a national model of how addiction should be treated and managed long-term. So he is an expert, so he will be here to field some questions because there is a, t there is a place for these meds, but it needs to be with accountability and it needs to be with a whole bunch of other things going on. So we'll do that. So with that, we're going to start with the video. So we'll start with Dan. As a parent. 
apparent, I think most of you are concerned about all these illegal drugs, the heroin, the marijuana, uh, the meth. But you need to understand that the legal drugs are just as dangerous. Forgetting it from your neighbor or your friend, it's not hard at all. If people are taking prescription drugs for non-medical purposes, they are not taking medicine. They're doing drugs. It's easy to start, and it's painful to stop. Prescription drugs are prescription for a reason. If you take too many of a prescription narcotic, you die. Chelsea was very well liked by her friends and by her teachers. Ronnie was going down to Tennessee State to be the next player to come out of Tennessee State. Joey was extremely popular, just surrounded by friends. Mark was an athletic, fit looking kid. Aaron enjoyed talking and debating with any and all people. The prescription pain pill problem is a huge epidemic. This is an epidemic. This is an epidemic that is infiltrated our young people. We never had a conversation with Joey about prescription drugs because we truly had no idea that there was any kind of recreational use going on. How many guys know this The first time I started doing painkillers was when I was 17. I would steal pills from my friend's um, mom. Her stepmom had script for Vicodin. That was like heaven. I went in her room and stole Vicodin every day. He would uh, ask to use the bathroom in other people's homes, and he'd go in there and go in their medicine cabinets and steal prescription drugs. These medications are available everywhere in every socioeconomic environment. Ronnie was the starting halfback, one of our best players. He had several scholarship offers. Ronnie was very popular in the neighborhood. Ronnie was a neat freak, clean freak, always had his hair braided. When he got into the pill use, his mood changed. He changed, like, was it Dr. Jekyll or Mr. Hyde? Ronnie's appearance really deteriorated, and it was really unlike him. I said, are you doing drugs? And my son looked at me with these eyes of, how could you even think of that? I was um, walking up to football practice. My coach was walking towards me. He just had this crazy look on his face. He goes, you think they might find your brother? And I was like, to me, I was like, goof. And I was like, oh, I didn't know he went missing. So I was like trying to make him like goof and all. And uh, he was like, no, Justin, seriously, like, he might have found his body. And uh, I was like, wait a minute. I was like, whoa, what? He's like, yeah, they, they found, they discovered a body in an apartment in Telford. I never thought my son would take prescription drugs without a prescription. Parents often trip themselves up by asking a simple question. Are you using drugs? Mm -hmm. No. One has to be able to say, I'm seeing some signs here that concern me. He was a little bit more argumentative. We thought that was maybe hormones. The person has what we call pinpoint pupils. Literally, the pupils look like a pinpoint. She slept odd hours. We didn't know why he was sleeping so late. If I wasn't able to get high, then I didn't want to get out of bed because, you know, the physical withdrawals. We were missing tinfoil from the kitchen, missing spoons. We find the pens that were cut in half and straws. There were a lot of charges coming on the credit cards. We thought that there was somebody stealing money out of our account. That's probably a pretty good clue that there's something going on. Joey was pretty upset with his roommates who were spending all the money on medication. Had I known that the medications that they were taking were so dangerous, I would have told them, you know, you haven't got to that place. If you feel something's going on, you gotta investigate. I thought it was just a phase. We had parted when we were in high school. And it's just sort of a phase you go through as you go, you know, experience life and you grow out of it. And I thought he was on that track. Joey had been found and and he was unconscious. He had all these medications that he had just received from this doctor. More than likely, he pressed and snorted it. We're just being completely hit blindly by, you know, a situation we had absolutely no understanding of and um, no notice of. And in the meantime, my husband's in the house. I'm out front of it, in the front of the house, just, you know, wondering what we're, we're dealing with here. And so finally, Joe just came out and said, he's gone.
and was downstairs getting ready for work. And Cookie told me she couldn't get Mark down. Mark was powerful and had the nickname in some circles of Tank. I reminded her that what she had to do was get a cup of water and splash him with it and stay out of his way. And she told me um, it was different. We found a clear plastic bag with loose pills. I'm not sure if he even thought he was doing drugs, and I know that sounds crazy, but it's not like he was heroin or cocaine. We followed the ambulance to the hospital. A few minutes later, uh, someone came in and told us that Mark was dead. We never thought that was a possibility. I had no idea that kids were abusing this. I came home one night, saw the basement light on, and went up to the window, and uh, my son was uh, crushing and snorting the pills. We would find pills in the shoes, in the jackets that are hanging in the closet, in the pockets. I found some pills hidden under this cushion. They were in his socks. I never checked my kids' socks. He took the light switch plate off and put them in there. Look everywhere. Is it an invasion? No. You're doing the right thing as a parent. I would question Chelsea, and she would always assure me that everything is fine and nothing's wrong. Kids don't want to get in trouble, so they're going to tell you exactly what you want to hear. There was always something down deep inside that said to me, something's wrong. You doubt yourself because you wonder if you're making a bigger deal out of something. You know, maybe deep down, my parents knew that I was high. You can't always believe your child when their lives get bigger and they're trying to hide substance abuse. I knew her inside and out, and I remember Chelsea as the little girl that she used to be. I looked at her, and I only saw the most beautiful son in the world. It was very difficult to think that she would be lying to me, which she was. She was out using and abusing prescription drugs. Long-acting agents like OxyContin are meant to be delivered in the body over a period of hours, if not a day. If they're chewed, crushed, and snorted, you get the entire dose at one blast, and if the body's not ready to accommodate that, you will stop breathing. We needed to call the police. But what are the neighbors going to think? Put all of that aside and focus on what's important, as difficult as it may be. Families can't get too caught up in the idea that, uh, oh, there may be an arrest, a charge, or my son or daughter, uh, they could be in jail. Um, they, they could be in the morgue. The law saved my life. The law and my the cops and me, I don't know where I would be right now. It was the most difficult thing to do, to call the police on your, on your own child. It was horrible. I have gone from putting importance on things like what college are you going to get into to just celebrating the fact that she's alive today. Um, she's doing very well. She's clean and sober. She's productive. She's sweet. And I have her back and I'm thankful. And it's wonderful. Aaron had spent the night at a friend's and they found him blue and non-responsive. They took him to a local hospital. He was using Vicodin, uh, which we found out through his toxicology, what was in his blood system. I witnessed him have two heart attacks in ICU. He had staph, he had pneumonia, he went through seizures. The doctor was explaining to us that he was going to die. We held his hands on each side and we started crying. And he just laid there. People use the medications in an abusive way, not knowing what the full consequences are, and somebody ends up here. Within 24 hours, Aaron had opened his eyes.
parents are the first line of defense in terms of prescription drug abuse. You gotta sit your kids down. You gotta tell them about the severity of the problem. There's a number of steps that you can take. Educate your child and yourself very early. Anybody who feels that this can't happen to uh, my child. Or it could happen to your kid. Make sure that you don't have excess pills in your home. Keep your medication locked up because you're never gonna notice that something's gone. What my mom does is she has to take home pee tests that I gotta take. No, I wanna keep my mom proud of me. I don't wanna let her down. You need to have the conversation with them about drug and substance abuse, and you need to include prescription drugs and guide them so they're able to get through their high school years and then through college and through their college years drug-free. Have this conversation before it's too late to have this conversation. <laughs> for the courageous families in that video that um, decided to come forward and share their stories. There is nothing easy about addiction or when a loved one has an addiction. So I just want to open this time up to get your response to this video. Is this new information? Is this information? Just however you want to respond. If anybody has comments or any questions just from what they saw. <coughs> Yes. I just wondering, are they showing anything like this in the high schools to the students? You know, I believe each high school handles um, this issue a little bit differently. Some high schools do a little bit more than others. Um, but certainly with Rosecrans, we try to be as available as we can to help schools and provide resources and things like that. So schools certainly are doing the gamut from bringing in big speakers to doing assemblies to talking about these issues and then some schools do very little. So I think with all of our support and voices we can change that. Did you have something? Yes, um, I'm 17, I'm a senior in high school. You want to come on up? Yeah. This is Dr. Singla's daughter. <laughs> um, I'm 17 years old, I'm in high school, I'm a senior and let me just say, they should not be talking about drugs as much as they should be. It's become a severe issue. Very many of my close friends do it, and they're not talking about it as much as they should. And like parents think that they are, a lot of schools are, but I can tell you not a lot of schools are. They're not informing high school kids at all about any of these issues. I mean, they are issues, and us kids know that, but not like to the severity that it is at all. Right, thank you for sharing that. And I think the important thing is, too, we can be the voice. We need to have these discussions in our homes. We, we can't always rely on the schools or the churches. We need to be the voice. And I think that's where part of my heart comes in. Because as a clinician for over five years, I was always shocked at what people didn't know. And how easily people that were using could bamboozle their parents. It, it never ceased to amaze me. And what we know about addiction is it's... It is easy to get bamboozled because you love your loved one. You want to believe your loved one. And what we know is that usually the chief enablers are the people closest emotionally. So that's going to be a spouse or a parent. So this thing called denial is a defense mechanism. And it kicks in. And it, it keeps us from facing the truth because it's a hard pill to swallow to say, you know what, my son or daughter has an addiction. Or you know what, my spouse has an addiction. And I don't know if you caught it in the video, but the one woman shared who had the daughter, she said, I just didn't trust myself. I doubt it. And that's what happens. We doubt. And I tell people all the time, your gut instinct is there for a reason. 99.9% .9 of the time, your gut is right. If it smells like a fish and it looks like a fish, it usually is a fish. But it's, it's sometimes we get manipulated because we want to believe the best and we really don't know. And so sometimes we get manipulated. I was never surprised on the unit. Say somebody came in and they were, their primary drug of choice was heroin or their primary drug of choice was alcohol. 
and yet they came in on prescription meds that were addictive. Well, as my job as the counselor, I need to have that discussion. I wanted them to sign a release, I wanted to talk to their prescribing doctor, and I wanted them to write a letter of accountability stating I am being treated for an addiction and I no longer want to be prescribed this addictive med. Well, let me tell you something. I found out really fast who wanted to get well and who didn't. Because you can sit in treatment and you can say, yep, yep, here's my assignment, ma'am, okay, yep, I surrender. You can say all that stuff, but the rubber meets the road when you're willing to bring your doctors on board and to say, I can no longer be prescribed these medications. I saw patients turn on me really quick and I got called all, all sorts of names and no way in hell you're calling my doctor lady because they wanted their prescription drugs because they knew. And so it's not for the faint hearted. <laughs> for family members or for anybody in the field, it's not for the faint hearted. Because again, you're not fighting your loved one, you're fighting an addiction that has gotten hold of your loved one. And it's not gonna let go easily. It's just not gonna happen. Any other comments to the video? Yes. Well, you know, I, yeah, I had a couple of surgeries also uh, and the pain medications. But what amazed me was that uh, when I received the prescription, the number that I originally had was quite extremely generous. I did not need that much. And even it allowed me for a refill, which I did not need. So I mean, I, I, I cause sometimes they even had one or two refills. I'm like, I didn't need them that long. Right. I could have taken them, but I didn't need them because the pain was was being mitigated. Right. So right. I think doctors need a little need, need to be a little bit more uh, conservative. Yeah. Do you want to say anything about that, Doctor Singler? Yes. Since uh, that's your. Some doctors are. Uh, extremely generous in their prescribing habits, yes. and uh, some doctors are really chintzy. Um, there's a new law that's going to affect October 1st, mm -hmm. which is changing one of the most commonly prescribed narcotics, uh, Norco, Vicodin, Hydrocodone, all of them with the same one. We used to be able to write that with 11 refills, so not for a year. So the law going to affect October 1st is that you can't do any refills. Mm -hmm. So you're gonna see the generosity drop, you're gonna see the number of refills drop. Um, once that's complete, there's going to be very few medications that you can actually, narcotic medications that you can actually uh, prescribe with refills. So things are slowly starting to change. It just takes a lot of time. Mm -hmm. And you know, doctors, you know, or like anyone else, everyone has a habit of a way that they do things. And so, uh, you know, some doctors are like, if I give enough medications, I get a refill. I'm not going to get any phone calls back in the middle of the night saying I'm uncomfortable. But um, you know, with this new law, that's going to take that part away too. Yes. One more question. Um, I had read, uh, oh, I don't know where, or some time ago, that the heroin, the heroin use by young people had been rising, and is that in part due to the fact that I think it was mentioned before that uh, you know prescription drugs can be extremely expensive. Yes. So is that one of the reasons why the young people are switching over? Yes, because heroin is much cheaper. Um, and it's infiltrated Chicago. Chicago is a major hub for heroin, and it's infiltrated all the suburbs, surrounding suburbs. And so as many people, I think Artie alluded to it real quick, um, people sometimes start with a prescription for a painkiller, and that can become a little bit more challenging to figure out how my doctor is going to keep refilling this, or um, it can be expensive. So people will oftentimes then switch to heroin, because it's on the street, it's accessible, and it's cheap. So that can happen. Yes. Any other comments about the video or questions that that video spawned? Okay, I'm going to go into the action points and then as if questions come up, um, please let us know. So the action points that we want to talk about tonight are one, the first one is you want to safeguard your home. Um, you brought up an interesting point. You said when the doctor prescribed you the meds, you didn't need them all. Okay, so maybe that doctor was a little generous, but part of why I'm doing this is so that you know, get rid of those medications safely. Because what happens is, that happens a lot. I, got, I had carpal tunnel surgery, and I was prescribed a painkiller. I think it was Vicodin. Well, it didn't agree with me. I got nauseous, I got sick, I couldn't take it. That med sat there. All of us, if we sometimes look in our medicine cabinets, there's things that we've been prescribed for a bad ankle or a pain, and we're not using them. We used it two days or whatever. Get rid of it. 
get rid of it safely. Because if you've noticed where all of these kids, the majority of these kids are getting their prescriptions are from friends and family's medicine cabinets. So we have a problem. So again, my big thing is empowering and educating. Because the more people that figure this out, yes, gen doctors may be generous, but if you don't need that medication, get it out of the house and get it out safely. Um, as they were saying, you can, a lot of the police departments will take back those prescription pills from you. That's probably the best way to get rid of those pills. And take off your identifying information. You can do that. I think part of that program is Dan does that as well, takes off those identifying information, but do that for yourself. So one, monitor the amounts of the medications that you have. If you have um, a teenager that's been prescribed something, I think the first question is, do they really need something that strong? So I would encourage you to have that conversation with your doctor. Ask, is this addictive? Ask, do they need to be on it? Is there another alternative? Second, know how much is in there. Um, you should really be the gatekeeper of that medication. You should know where it is, you should know how many pills are in. If your child or somebody was prescribed 30 pills on Monday, on Tuesday there should be 29 pills in that bottle. On Wednesday there should be 28, and so on and so forth. Sometimes we're not monitoring that. We're just not. But I, and, I, and it's not to, to assume people are gonna take advantage, it's just to be wise. Because as, you said, as we said, the landscape has changed. So we have to be wise. And I think wisdom would say with any type of addiction med, we need to have some accountability with it because the potential is there to like it. As I said, when I took an opiate, I didn't like it. I got sick, I got nauseous. I've had other patients tell me, fell in love. Where have you been all my life? I had confidence, I had energy. I was hooked the first pill I took. That's why people have different drugs of choices. Everybody's not a heroin addict. Everybody's not an alcoholic. Everybody doesn't like cocaine. We all respond differently to different drugs. And that's why people have different drugs of choices. So what you might say, oh gosh, that pain pill is terrible. Somebody else, it might be like the heavens opened and I felt fantastic. So it's important to know that. Um, we talked about securing your medication. Should be in a locked place. Um, or definitely somewhere where you know what's there and have an inventory. A lot of people have no idea what's in their medicine cabinet. I don't know. I might have been prescribed that three years ago, whatever. Know what's in your medicine cabinet. Make sure there's some accountability there. And if you're not using the medicine, get rid of it. Um, the second thing is to know the signs and symptoms of medicine abuse. There are some cards in the back that have adult signs and symptoms and adolescent signs and symptoms you can pick up. But just real quickly, I'm gonna talk about three classes of drugs, and Dr. Singo, if you wanna add anything. So the one we've talked about, the opiates, the narcotics, the painkillers, this is Oxycontin, Vicodin, Norco, Percocets, Dilaudid, Fentanyl, Morphine, any type of pain medication. Those can be highly, highly addictive and abuse. And typically, when you have painkiller um, abuse, you're gonna see depression, low blood pressure, decreased breathing rate, confusion, sweating, constricted pupils. They talked about it. They showed them pinpoint pupils. Should be a hallmark sign, something isn't right. Okay? So when you think about the medications that are abused, opiates are a big one, painkillers. The next one would be benzodiazepines. These are anti-anxiety meds or sleep medications. So some of the benzodiazepines that are prescribed, Xanax, Valium, Clonopin, Lorazepam, Ambien, Lunesta, those are sleep aids. Those can be highly, highly addictive as well. Some of the same side effects you'll see as you do with the opiates, the drowsiness, confusion, poor judgment, dizziness, slurred speech, respiratory depression. And here's what's tricky. I've had a lot of clients who didn't mean to commit suicide ended up overdosing because they were taking a benzodiazepine and they were drinking and they did not recognize that that was a lethal combination because alcohol and benzodiazepines, they're both central nervous system depressions and so they're gonna slow down your breathing and you're gonna stop breathing. And so I have seen unintentional deaths just from ignorance, they didn't know. They didn't know that you shouldn't be using those in combination and it was truly ignorance. So the benzos, any type of sleep aid or anti-anxiety. And then the third one is stimulants. 
These are your ADHD meds. This is the Concerta, the Ritalin, the Dexedrine. These can be highly, highly addictive meds. Um, as you've seen, people, they were crushing them and snorting them. That can be um, a huge stimulant. If you do not have attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, it is not going to slow you down. It's going to speed you up. And what we've seen is many people like that, the energy. Uh, college campuses, these are now becoming um, what college campuses are using to pull all-nighters. Kids are tr they're studying for exams, they're working a job, they're in sports. They've got so much going on that it's become kind of very socially acceptable to grab some of these pills, to pull an all-nighter, okay? That is prescription drug abuse. You do not have a prescription for that. And some of the side effects that you'll see with that are going to be a little bit different. You're going to see weight loss, agitation, irritability, insomnia, high blood pressure, irregular heartbeat, anxiety, impulsive behavior. Any questions about those signs and symptoms? And I guess I would like to just add, you don't have to be an expert in, oh my gosh, is that a sign, is that not? Trust your gut. Because like those parents said, there were some things that were unraveling. There were some signs. And sometimes we ignore those signs. Again, I think it's because we want to believe the best. We want to believe it's nothing. We want to believe it's a phase. And that denial kicks in for us. And we want to believe our loved one. But trust your gut. No signs and symptoms. If there's missing things in your house, if there's mood changes, if people are dropping out of sports or their friends are changing, those are significant signs that you should be tuned into. You really need to be tuned in um, because you're the one that probably is going to have the best pulse on that. You know, they always say if you want to know if you have a problem with something, ask the person's spouse. So if you want to know if I have a problem with something, your best answer is probably going to be ask my husband because he lives with me day in and day out. Okay? And by habit, we all like to sometimes minimize our own behaviors or different things like that. And as the parents or as the loved ones, you see things. In the home, you see things. You see those irregular things that come up. So trust your gut. Trust your gut. Any questions about those medicines for Dr. Singler or myself? So say you have a kid that comes home and is exhibiting some of those signs. Could you take them to the hospital and then do a blood test on them? Or how would you get verification that there's something in their system? And how long would you stay in their system? Well, depending on the severity of the symptoms, a hospital probably isn't going to take you in and do a drug test. Now, if they're going through withdrawal or they're ODing, sure, an ER is going to take you in and part of the practice is going to be to get a UA and find out what are we dealing with, what's in that system. But if they're not at that level of emergency state, I would say there are home tests, Walgreens and things like that, or you can go to a treatment center like Rosecrans. We offer free assessments and part of that assessment is a UA, a urinalysis. That is an out-of-pocket cost. I think it's about 45 bucks. But we need that test because if you get an assessment without a UA, I don't like that practice because a UA is going to tell you what's really going on. You really need a UA with, with when we're talking about drugs and alcohol because, again, human nature, we're not always going to disclose that I'm using this or I'm doing that. So sometimes that test tells us the truth and what's really going on. And I, I recommend if you do suspect that, that that is your right. We're we're going and we're going to get an assessment. We're going to talk about. We're going to talk with a professional about that. Do you have anything to say with that too? Um, you know, keep in mind. You know, anytime there's a big uh, sudden. Well, going back two things. One is, um, you know, if you look over a period of time, if there's a sudden change in someone's personality or behavior, you know, they stop going to school. Um, they're not hanging out with their friends or isolating, or they're missing things at, at work or things are just disappearing. That's one of the global cues you look at to relate to substance abuse. In, in relation to the, the situation that, that you just brought up where your child comes home and is acting a little weird, one of the first things to look at is, you know, is, you know, you don't automatically jump to substance abuse. Obviously, you want to make sure something, something else is going on. So if it's a serious enough change, you know, they're confused or anything, by all means, take them to the ER. Um, you know, you don't want to assume that someone is just assuming, uh, taking drugs when it's something else. But uh, if it's not to that uh, level of severity, if it's a, a adolescent or a teenager, <coughs> by all means, run to Walgreens, grab a test, make an appointment at Rosecrans. Um, the problem is the detection. 
Uh, depending on the drug, it can be anywhere from 24 to 72 hours. So if you're not able to get in and get an assessment right away, you may not be able to have uh, the information uh, in the urine when you finally do go to those grants. But the advantage of having the urine drug uh, testing done at home from a kit that you get at Walgreens is that when you go to the assessment, you have some black and white evidence for which to start a dialogue with, uh, with the child. And I know this may seem hard to believe, but sometimes our loved ones will stall. <laughs> so if they know you're on to them, they might be kicking and screaming because they know that in 72 hours I'm going to be good to go. And then I'll go for that assessment, Mom, or then I'll do it. And so that's why I always like the element of surprise. And guess what? As your parent, I get to surprise you because I'm paying the mortgage. <laughs> so there is something to be said for a, a spontaneous test. Um, because you like you said. If you can't get in right away. Right, and if you can't get in right away, there's something to be said. So don't worry because sometimes that opportunity will come back up again. I was gonna make a suggestion. Don't wait until you think your child is under the influence. Get the drug test and let them know you have it. So when they come home, you have it. They know the consequence. They come home, they're under the influence, you already have the drug test. Yeah. Don't wait. Great suggestion. Buy yeah. it now. That's a great suggestion. Yes. Get the test. And when they pee in the cup, put your hand around the cup, make sure it's not too hot, too cold. Um, yeah. It should be body temperature. Um, you know, a lot of times kids will add water or uh, cold or hot to dilute it so it turns the test negative because it's just diluted. So you can tell that if the urine is too cold or it's too hot. I, and I will say this, I don't want to discourage anybody. I've probably been in this field too long, so I've seen, yeah. I know exactly what you're talking about. Sometimes people will manipulate tests. There are products out there to manipulate drug tests. There's all sorts of things, what people can go to lengths to. It's unbelievable how sometimes people can get away with this. But again, I always go back to watch the behavior. I, you know, I've had confrontations with clients where, you know, they're going to argue this and this and that because of the test. Forget the test. I can tell by your behaviors. You are not working recovery, period. I can tell by your attitude. I can tell by your actions. So sometimes you don't need the test. It's great to have, but sometimes people can be savvy and can manipulate that system. And sometimes it's hard to stay one step ahead of the game. So trust your gut again. Another thing to really look at with kids, I work for another treatment center too. Yes, you're doing a great job. Oh, thank you. Um, social media. Check what's on their website. Check what's on their Facebook page. Check whether or not they've been looking up passmydrugtest.com. <laughs> <laughs> Which is an actual website, by the way. Oh, um, yeah. But, you know, look into what's being said. Look into the pictures that they're, that's on their Facebook, you know. Um, it's, it, it's amazing how safe they think the wonderful world of the web is. They think that no adults has ever figured out how to push a button on a computer. And so between friends, they will, they will have these conversations and post, they will post pictures of the alcohol at the party. They will send messages about what can you get from your grandma's house. And that gives you, again, it gives you a talking point, but it also lets you stay one step ahead. Because if they're already on PassMyDrugTest.com, you're going to have to get creative. Yeah, right. You had something you want to say? Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. Sorry. Um, I have two things. One, you're going to go business with your dad in a couple years? <laughs> <laughs> I should. I probably really should. Um, no, two things. Um, one, back to the whole high school being informed type thing. Um, I think it's more <coughs> that it's a big miscommunication between the school and the parents. Because parents think that the school is talking about it way more than they are, and then the other way around, the school thinks that what, yeah, parents. The other, yeah, the school thinks that the parents are talking about, it, and no one is it really. And like it's more about like bullying. They make that like the big issue, but this is also a big issue too. It's getting more and more worse as we get older, as I'm gr grown up into my high school years, and um, back to the social media thing as well. Um, yeah, um, coming from like a kid's point of view, I think that <laughs> kids don't think that their parents check their social media, which they may or may not, but they should. I have many friends who post like their like alcohol, their drugs, all on their social media, thinking that no one will see it, 
and that it's fine and it's like not, you shouldn't be posting it, you should be checking your child's social media. Um, their Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, all that that they have, you should be checking that and making sure that your child is on the right track and doing what they should be doing and not drugs and alcohol. I am so glad you were saying that. <laughs> 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 well, yeah, can you get that? It's on video. Your dad is saying, so you have just publicly said, Dad, you can check all my stuff. No, 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 I have been. Oh, you have? Oh, okay, <laughs> okay. So now you see When I was, stuff. yeah, when I got into high school and, yeah, he was caught up more than other parents are. And I mean, give or take that, I learned more from my parents that my dad's a doctor, my mom's a nurse, but other parents should be informed too. Parents, um, other family, close friends, everybody should be informed in informing kids and adults about how severe that this issue really is. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's why really we're doing it at night like this, to just get the word out, to get people talking. And just basically listen carefully to what they're saying, you know, be kind of nosy and uh, just listen to what they're saying uh, if things don't add up. And like you said, their, their behaviors uh, lead to that. There's another way to dilute the drug test and that's to, to drink a lot of water mm -hmm. before you go in there. And I had one 15 year old while I'm assessing him, he had to go to the bathroom three times. <laughs> I go, if you're 50 years old, do you do that? <laughs> no, but if you're 15, you don't have to do that. Yeah. So, he had yeah, to be there and you knew something was up. <laughs> yeah. I related to him. Right, yeah. <laughs> Right, right. Any other comment? Yes, in the back? I just wanted to make a comment. I so was aware, and I'm, you know, this is a prescription drug safety that, that I'm about. I've been to many of the schools where they offer the programs for the parents. The parents don't show up. Yes. It's very sad because the schools are right there trying to do it. The parents, oh, not my kid, my kid would do that. I live in the Northwest suburbs, so, you know, I did some things on the North Shore. And some of those parents are really interested. The rich, the richer, like Lake Forest. They had a program there, and there were so many parents that were there, you know. And so some of these parents think, well, my kid wouldn't do it because, you know, he's a good kid, he's a good student, he's on the football team, all that kind of stuff. And they have this, this stigma or this idea that it's somebody in the ghetto that's going to be doing drugs. Right. And I think the other thing that I've learned is that from parents who have lost loved ones, don't be a friend to your child. Mm -hmm. One woman, her son, when they have friends over, they'd be drinking in the basement, they'd be doing a little pot, you know, okay, they're home, I know what they're doing, and, you know, don't be a friend, be a parent, yeah. and I think that's another important issue, but like, you got to get the parents to get out and realize this can happen anywhere, and they're not, they're not getting it. Yeah. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. Well, that's a good point. Addiction knows no discrimination. It knows no race, no class, no socioeconomic, no socioeconomic status. In fact, I was just in a northern suburb. And we did a big training for peak performance event, and it was about athletes and use amongst athletes. And sometimes um, kids hide behind their success um, because they're savvy. They're savvy. And sometimes they can hide behind their success. Um, so I, I'm glad that you made that point. Yes? You're talking a lot about kids. How does this translate to adults? Good question. <laughs> so how does this translate to adults? Well, it's across the board. Painkillers, benzodiazepine, and stimulants. Whether you're an adolescent or an adult. I came from an adult treatment where I worked, I primarily worked with adults. And again, it can happen very easily. I saw many patients, um, the Xanax, the Valium, the Norcos, abuse those. People figure out really quick that this, I like this. I like how this made me feel. Um, a term that has developed is doctor shopping, where sometimes the right hand doesn't know what the left hand's doing. I've had patients go to as great of lengths to take a hammer to their knee so they could walk into an ER and get what they needed because they needed that fix. Um, so again, whether you're an adolescent or an adult, it can happen. And so my big thing, you know, I thought it was interesting too that, you know, there's a place for these medications, um, but I, I tend to be pretty conservative given everything I've seen. Um, and it's interesting, I, I've met people that have been on Xanax for 20 years and they're still <laughs> anxious and depressed and their life stinks. So how's that working for you? <laughs> you know, or they've been on Norco and all kinds of painkillers and they have no quality of life. No quality of life. And I've seen some patients that came in kicking and screaming and cursing when they found out that their addictive prescriptions were going to be destroyed because that was part of the admission process on our unit 
boy, you saw some really interesting moods real quick. <laughs> um, but my point is that there are alternatives to those um, to pain issues. I know you have a pain practice as well and deal with pain. There are alternatives. Um, but I've seen some of the toughest patients that you would have thought, oh my gosh, this is just never going to change, where they've come off of these meds and they can't even believe it. They can't believe that they can live without this stuff. So it's, it's alive and well, whether it's adults or teens. And a lot of this stuff can be found on the street. Um, it's amazing to me. I just assessed somebody recently had a five-year Norco addiction and it was all off the street. All off the street. And family was clueless. All of it was off the street. Um, it, so it was interesting that the pills is uh, it's not the same as going and buying heroin and buying cocaine. It's a pill that can go to the doctor and have it prescribed. I'm just kind of cutting up the middleman because this is what he's going to give me anyways. Right. Mm -hmm. And there's all these justifications. So, um, you know, because it's something that's prescribable, because it's something that you can legally obtain, um, it's initially looked at as safer. not as bad or safer. Yes. And, and, you know, people get in trouble very first time because they're taking something that's much stronger than what they can actually take. But you're absolutely right. It's, it's looked at as being safe. It's not yes. you know, dirty. I'm not sticking a needle in my arm. This is something that you know my doctor would give me. I just mm -hmm. don't have time to go to the doctor today, so I'm going to mm -hmm. borrow my neighbor's yes. uh, medications. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, this illusion that it's safer, particularly with youth, but even on the adult unit, it was very tricky sometimes because within the group of patients, oftentimes people that were addicted to prescriptions saw themselves much differently than the person that was using heroin. And we had to gently correct that <laughs> and help them to see, no, 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 let's look at your life. Um, were you doctor shopping? Were you lying? Were you taking more? Because all of those same things start to happen um, with our word not meaning anything, saying things that we don't follow up on or the consequences. And so but there's a lot of times you're going to get more pushback that I have an addiction because I am prescribed these by a doctor. So I do not have an addiction. I have a legitimate issue. So you're going to get more pushback. Family's going to hear more pushback. Probably the hardest patient is a chronic pain patient. <laughs> because I have pain. I have pain. How can you, you know, keep me from that? I was wondering if the doctor could speak a little bit about um, um, opioid um, hyperalgesia and maybe a little bit about if you're, on, if you're depressed, what happens when you take pain pills? Yeah. So, um, the most powerful chemical in, in the brain is an endorphin. It's what controls your mood and your energy level. So when you hear about serotonin, you hear about norepinephrine, you hear about all those other antidepressants commercials on TV, their net effect is to increase your endorphin level. So an endorphin is an opiate. And so your body has this ability to self-regulate itself. It doesn't want to waste extra energy. So if you have a male athlete who's shooting testosterone, their testicles stop making testosterone. He figures I'm getting it elsewhere when I make it. So the same thing happens when people are taking opiates. You take opiates long enough and the body's part of the brain that makes endorphins shuts down or cuts down. So if you don't take your opiates, you get profoundly depressed. You have a lack of energy, you don't feel like doing anything. And until you take those opiates, you don't feel normal. So what used to give you a high now is just in order to feel normal. There's another subset of patients that we've seen. Um, some of them have family histories of addictions. And let's say this is a normal endorphin level. They're just born just a touch lower. It's not that they go through life depressed, um, but prom wasn't as cool as what everyone else thought. It was. Getting married was awesome, but the honeymoon wasn't as great as everyone says. It's just they go through life, they're happy. But the first time they take anything that gives them an endorphin rush, it's not that they're high. They actually, for the first time, feel normal. So going back to the whole pain, what happens with the pain cycle is there's two things. One is as you're taking the opioid, you become more tolerant to the effects. The only effects you don't become tolerant to are the really deadly side effects. So the pain relief, uh, the mood relief, all those types of things, your body becomes tolerant. The things that you can die from, uh, the heart disease that it can cause or the respiratory, you don't become tolerant. So the more you take, the more effect it has. But it has the same effect on pain. So the more opiates you take, 
the less it works for pain. And it has another uh, effect called opioid-induced hyperalgesia, which basically what that is a fancy term for. It. The longer you're on pain meds, the more sensitive you become to pain. Go so figure. Think about that for a second. Tough guy, you know, <laughs> you see in the office a big bodybuilder weightlifters, you could beat them in the head with a two by four, and nothing would phase them. They're on Norco for a year. Now you just kind of accidentally bump them when they're crying in pain because they're in so much pain because their bodies become sensitized to it. It's the only way really to break that is to get them off of all of that. And so, you know, a lot of times you, you, you have chronic pain patients, and one of my discussions is you're coming in, you're on Oxycontin, you're on Norco, you're on fentanyl, you're on diazepam, and your pain is a nine out of 10. Well, what the hell is it doing for you? <laughs> you know, are, How's that working for you? Yeah. Exactly. Bill would say. Why are you taking for it? So that's you know a good way to, to see if someone is rating their pain as astronomical despite being on pain meds. It's a question of why are you taking them and do you really need them? And when we get a lot of these chronic pain patients off of their meds, you find that once they're off of their meds, their pain is completely manageable without the use of narcotics, mm -hmm. which goes back to the whole opioid use type of analgesia. So. Um, in uh, one thing I'm going to add about withdrawal, uh, if you look at opiates, stimulants, withdrawal from them are not deadly or life-threatening generally, unless there's a big medical condition. Now the patient may wish they were, <coughs> but they're not deadly. The two that can kill you are alcohol withdrawal and sedative withdrawal, uh, both by causing seizures and, and things of that nature. Yes, we talk, I, I hear a number been reading a lot about this as we talk a lot about hydrocodone you know and all the opioids and, but I think and um, what's your take I know what mine is being in the addiction field on tramadol tramadol came out well, 15 years ago and it was supposed to be a synthetic opioid it had absolutely no addictive properties mm -hmm. very quickly they found out that that wasn't true <laughs> because it became in, in, in the first period the most commonly abused easily accessible drug for healthcare professionals among nurses and doctors. And they found out that there's a definite addiction potential and abuse potential. What I mean by addiction uh, dependence potential is if you're taking medicine, you stop it and you have a withdrawal. So that's the pure FDA definition. You know, as addiction professionals are, to take on it is not quite that simple. But tramadol is extremely addictive and also very potentially dangerous, right, because it can cause seizures and it interacts with a lot of medications, including a lot of the common antidepressants that are used today. Can you so, say anything about um, muscle relaxers, too? Yes. Because uh, that's another big one. Muscle relaxers, by the most potent of all muscle relaxers, is valid. I mean, we don't, luckily, we don't use that as much as we do other things. But, you know, the, the muscle relaxers in class um, tend to have some sedative properties to it. So they tend to make people tired. Um, and so that, in and of itself, just because it's mood altering, it makes you somewhat lethargic. It can lead to addictive potential, if it's not necessarily physical, at least psychological. With that being said, there are some muscle relaxants that are absolutely physically dependent, and I can bet you 95 to 97 percent of doctors and nurses would not even know that that's the case. The most common one that we look at is one called soma. Mm -hmm. So soma, when you take it, it actually breaks down into a byproduct of valium. And so when people are on SOMA for even more than two or three weeks on a continuous basis, they'll have withdrawal. And they can have the withdrawal that we associate with uh, sedative withdrawal, so it could be life-threatening. But most physicians and nurses are not aware that it does, and it's a very, very common prescribed combination. SOMA, Xanax, and Vicodin. Mm -hmm. Those are uh, the Holy Trinity. The Holy Trinity. The Holy Trinity. The Holy Trinity of, yes, no. of, of prescriptions in terms of what uh, when you have someone with an addictive personality or going to a doctor's office, that's what they're looking for. Mm -hmm. Is there other questions? Did I see other hands? Yes. I just wanted to make a comment. I work with some adolescents, and not only with the prescription, but with the over-the-counter or mixing prescriptions with over-the-counter. Mm -hmm. Like you were saying, it's that it's unfortunately I see with adolescents taking um, you know, sleep aids um, or also Benadryl. Um, mm -hmm. So those are things I think parents, um, you know, I talk to my client, adolescent clients about to, um, you know, just being aware of those things in the home that we imagine. And, yeah, that's very true. She's talking about over-the-counter um, things that uh, people can buy that can also have some mood-altering properties. Probably one of the biggest ones is the DXM, which is found in cough syrups. 
don't know if you want to say anything more about DXM or dextrodorphin. It's um, you distill it down, and if you look at ecstasy or things like that, that's basically concentrated DXM. So it can cause hallucinations when taken in excess. So it's it's readily accessible. Uh, it's not impossible to get. Um, and especially when taking a combination of other things. Right. And so kids get, you know, very clever uh, when it comes to mixing and matching. And they're so <coughs> underground that even as a physician, it's very hard to keep up with. Yeah. They're always one step ahead, and you know, with Reddit and, and using uh, other things on the internet, uh, it, it's very hard to keep track and, and keep mm -hmm. up on what's going. On. It is. Well, that being said, with all this doom and gloom, I, I will tell you this: <laughs> the practice that I have and internal medicine, addiction medicine, it, it's actually a gift. It is the coolest thing to do. Is when you help someone get sober or get clean, it is the closest thing you can to helping someone have a, a, a new life or a new birth. Mm -hmm. and, and so, you know, we, 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 they have two birthdays. They have the belly button birthday and the recovery birthday. So, you know, we've been talking all this negative stuff, but I, I guess one of the things I want to emphasize, mm -hmm. there is hope. I mean, there's a lot of hope. Success rates are very good. If you can get someone, get them to understand, get them motivated, get them engaged, and get them in the treatment, it's amazing how quickly you can turn someone's life around. Right. And I'm glad you said that, because that's, that's what this night is about. It's about bringing hope to people. Uh, Rosecrans, that's our motto, bringing help, hope, and recovery to families. Um, and there are, I mean, the video showed a lot of, um, you know, the ultimate that can happen, it, which is death. Addiction can take lives. But many, many people are in recovery. In fact, people ask me all the time, you know, when they knew particularly that I was in practice directly on a unit, they would say, oh, gosh, how do you do that job? And I kind of had the same mentality. Um, you know, it's, it's a crisis on a day-to-day -day basis. But you did. I saw people get well. And I told people, the day I don't see people get well is the day I'm getting out of this field. I continue to see people get well. And it's the best feeling in the world to see people recover their lives and recover um, their um, thinking, their families, their reputation, all those things are part of recovery. And um, it is possible. It is possible. And it helps when we're educated and when we know how to navigate because the average family, it's overwhelming. It is overwhelming to try to navigate this when you have a loved one in crisis. And as some of these families shared, they were caught completely off guard. They had no idea what was going on until it was like crisis moment and their loved one is passed out. So it can be very overwhelming, but that's why we want to have um, information like this. Um, Rose Grants is also starting a parent support group um, that'll be starting in October. There's been a lot of great support groups that have started in this um, area. Hero's a big one. Um, I applaud uh, John Roberts and Brian Kirk for the work that they've done and for the families that they've walked with. Um, there's numerous support groups that have, um, that have come up, but I encourage you, if this is something you're walking through, don't go it alone. Sometimes the shame or the stigma, please don't go it alone. There should be no shame or stigma. This is a disease. It happens. You, you almost can't find a family where addiction hasn't touched their family in some way, shape, or form. So I have found that the road traveled with others, the load is a little bit um, lighter when, you can, when people can relate and you can become educated. So we are here. Um, we want this night to be about hope. So thank you for pointing that out. Yes. I have a question for the doctor. So when you when you start taking a pain medication, you know, I mean, I guess different ones. I, I mean, if you're taking them for a long time, different ones will cause your body to become less tolerant of pain. Correct. And but the doctors would know that, right? When they prescribe. No. <laughs> no. 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 no, they didn't. That's, oh, that's why I yeah. have uh, a practice that I do is because yeah. doctors don't know that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's been a big push, you know, there's you know, temperature, blood pressure, mm -hmm. um, heart rate, and respiratory rate, now they added pain. And so it's now a patient right to have the pain treated. You can't question it. Mm -hmm. so, it's very subjective. It, you know, it, what's a 10 for me may be a 1 for you because you're tougher than I am. Um, but, uh, you know, so even in a hospital you have patients demanding my pain is not Mm -hmm. And you know that they are active drug abusers. So the next thing you know, you're getting called from administration, why aren't you taking care of this patient's pain, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You know, which, it's different for Dr. Gouda and I to handle, uh, because obviously the hospital knows what we do as our subspecialty. But it's a lot, le it's a lot less, no, it's
it's a lot harder for someone who's not trained like we are to handle a patient that's complaining of pain that's 10 out of 10 screaming in bed. You've got a nurse calling five times every hour saying this patient's complaining of pain and prescribing more meds. But in answer to your question, um, do most doctors know that the longer you give pain meds, you become more sensitive to pain? No. They don't. Most doctors no. do know that the longer you give pain meds, you're going to have to give more and more because dependence and tolerance. But I don't, I don't think all of them um, are fully aware of the impact that uh, long-term huh. medication use has on pain itself. Some do. Some are very knowledgeable about it. Some aren't. Um, so you have to be an advocate for yourself when you're receiving medications mm -hmm. like that. And you know, like you said, what you don't know, you don't know. You have to be educated. So if you're having surgery, you're having knee replacement, these are all things that you want to plan out. You know, with my primary care patients, we always plan out what we're doing when it's a planned procedure. You know, this is what we're going to do. This is how long you're going to be on it, roughly, give or take. And these are the guidelines. You know, obviously, emergencies are different, but um, the more you know, the better off you are. And good treatment should be acknowledging that and should be addressing the addictive pains and should be bringing in prescribing doctors for continuity of care and there should be a level of accountability there. We're going to move on and we're going to um, finish these next two points and because I want Michelle to share her story. So we talked about the signs and symptoms um, just to know. The third action step is to talk to family and friends and other parents. Again, you don't know what you don't know. The more we start having these conversations, the more natural it's going to be. You should be having these conversations with your loved ones. It's not just about say no to heroin and driving and texting and bullying. Have the conversation about prescription drugs as well. And then the fourth one, share the information with others, whether that's through so your social media, whether that's through your friends, etc. I do want to bring up uh, Michelle right now. Michelle um, has graciously agreed to share her personal story. So we're um, very glad to hear her tonight. So we're going to hear her, and then uh, we'll finish up with some questions. Okay. You know what? We can just use oh, this. Right? Hi. Um, my name is Michelle Aguilar, and um, I am here. Uh, I'm, I'm really excited about the topic. Uh, the, not the topic so much, but as the name of this coming to light. Um, for me, that was my experience, and um, I'm so grateful that there is a forum here that people can come and feel free to ask questions about this because it is so important to um, to become knowledgeable. You don't know what you don't know, just like what you said, and I can relate a lot to those families um, because my parents said all those things. Um, they said it's just a phase. They said it's, um, first of all, denial is really the number one thing. So. Any parents here today that don't see it or didn't see it, you know, it's it's very common that we don't that we us as I was the person that was abusing drugs, I didn't see it, I didn't want to see it. I compared myself to people of a vision that I had in my head of what a drug addict or or what a, a person that abuses stuff looks like, and um, and I didn't do those things, you know, and and so all it did was feed my denial and. Um, my, um, so I'm very grateful uh, to Dan Martin and, and um, for all the things that help families become aware because this is a family disease. It doesn't just affect me. It affects everyone that it comes in contact with. Um, I, um, my sobriety date is October 10th of 1987. Um, wow. I, I say that for simply to give you hope because we do see the ugly side of addiction, but there's another side that that when given when given the proper proper tools, there is hope um, that you can change your life around. Um, and um, so I say that not to say yay yay. Um, I say that because there is hope. There is um, there is a way out, and um, there is a way to shine light on this very very dark topic. And you're doing it by being here. Um, but also by sharing it to, to, to kill the stigma of what what this disease is about. Um, to, 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 to open your eyes and to, to share it with family members, to share it with friends, and you'll be able to see it. My family didn't see it, and that's not because... Michelle, can you talk a little bit about what your drug choice was, or what um, were you... Yeah. Using? Okay. Um, when I... Well, I can tell you that my mentality before I picked up 
my very first drug um, was I was searching. Um, there was no one, you know, I mean, we can all sit there and say, well, it was, the, it, was it this or was it that? I know that from the time that I was in second grade, I had a black hole in here. And I tried whatever I could to fill that hole. Um, it started out with, um, uh, in sixth grade, I, I started out with my, at my family's um, alcohol cabinet. Then it went to, you know, it was, which helped a little bit. And then there was pot, and that helped a little bit. And then there was um, speed, or, or actually, I loved what you said about the, you know, about the over-the-counter because it was called. I don't even know if they make this anymore, but it was called no dose. Oh yeah. And, yeah. And, oh, yeah. And, and now it's we like just those, those monster drinks are, are just amazing. To, not that I drink them, but I'm like those aren't allowed in my house. But anyway, um, the that's I, I kept searching. I kept searching, and for me. Um, those no-dos led to speed, which led to cocaine. But my drug of choice, like you talked about, because everybody has their thing, um, was my love affair with Xanax. And um, I got that through um, uh, years of abuse of, of speed and cocaine. And back in the 80s, that's what it was. Heroin really wasn't around like that. Um, but um, as I went further into um, those drugs, the more, the, the, the hole was bigger, but now the drugs were causing the hole to get bigger. So it kind of turned, it didn't stop anything. Um, and um, now the, the hole was being formed by the drugs because there's shame and there's guilt and, and I didn't want to feel that stuff. So I went searching and I had a ton of anxiety which was of course a lot, you do a lot of cocaine, you do a lot of speed, you're going to have anxiety. Um, and um, I searched, and at one point I felt like um, I was losing my mind. I called my regular physician. He um, sent me to a psychiatrist, and that was my drug, um, my my uh, um, drug dealer for the next two and a half years. Mm -hmm. um, and Xanax was my drug of choice. I of course um, mixed a lot of things. Alcohol and Xanax does not mix, and unfortunately I learned that the hard way a few times. Um, but uh, what happened with me is the dependence became so severe that I could not leave, get out of bed in the morning without my purse there that had Xanax in it. And um, I could not function, could not, um, I couldn't even imagine a life without it. Um, and it just got to be all the things that I thought when I would think of a, a drug, drug addict and the things that I said oh, I would never do, I ended up doing that and more. Um, and um, you talked about, you know, on the screen they talked about the lies. And um, we get really good at lying, guys. Um, so there's times when you know, my mom beat herself up in trying, why didn't I see this, why didn't I see that? I was really good at lying. I was really good at covering up. I was, I went to a girls, all girls Catholic high school. I was on the honor roll. I never got in trouble. I never got, I, I never got arrested. Those were the things that I did. I did a wonderful facade on the outside. Um, so, but I can tell you there were things that she didn't see because she didn't know. And for nobody to blame, she just didn't know. And that's why it's so awesome that you guys are here tonight, because you are opening your eyes. You're taking off the rose-colored glasses that we see things through. And you can see things for what they really are, aware of the signs, aware of... I'm going to tell you, I, I, um, um, in October of 87, I went into treatment. And the reason that, for myself, it was the first time that, um, yeah, I lied to everybody else, but I lied to myself. And in October of 1987 is the day that I got honest with myself. Um, and that was the first seed, that was the first start of recovery. And recovery can happen. I am, it is, um, I'm 46 years old. And um, today um, I have a wonderful husband. I have four wonderful teenagers. Um, and I can actually say that, they're wonderful teenagers. Um, are they crazy? Absolutely. Um, uh, having all those hormones in one house is crazy, but um, there are things 
that I think that are really important. And um, I love what the lady from AWARE said. It's not my job to be their friend. It is my job to be their parent. And they don't always like the consequences. They don't always like the things that I do. Um, but my job is, that is my job. My job is to um, protect them. My job is to um, teach them, to guide them. It is, I don't care, they don't always like me. They don't always like the things that I say or the rules that I put down, but they know that they can't fool me because I've done those things. Um, I do want to say, um, I have uh, one of my sons, um, and, and the reason I'm saying this is because in the area, they've all gone, they, um, they're all in the area schools. Um, three, two have graduated from Lincoln Way Central, and um, my husband and I have um, run youth groups in this area. And to be aware, it's not just high schools. Um, I can tell you that my, my son in seventh grade, that little thing that you talked about, that little stomach, that little intuition that we have, the, the, little, the little gut feeling, I had a little gut feeling, something, something's not right. I want to check his phone. Did he like that? Oh gosh, no. But I checked his phone and it wasn't him, actually. I saw he had to take a medication for something that he had for, for a short period of time. And his friend found out that he was taking that. And his friend wanted him to bring some of those to school. And that's what the text was. Please bring some of those things that you're taking to school tomorrow. Seventh grade. It's here. It's in the junior highs. It's at Martino. It's in the high schools. It's you know, Liberty, it is not just in high schools. It starts, the reason I brought up the youth group is because um, my husband and I ran a Friday night youth group for um, quite a few years, and we had kids come from sixth and seventh grade high. It's not, it doesn't, it starts, it doesn't just start in high school, it starts early. But there are signs, and you know, I was met with denial by the parents, when I said, you need to come and pick up your child, they're high. What are you talking about, they're high? If we could just, um, if I could say anything tonight, it's just um, to, to the, I don't know if there was anything that my parents could have done differently. I do know that um, denial is very thick and it's part of this disease. But um, I also know that there's hope. And um, yeah, I'm just I'm just really glad to be here. I'm so excited that you guys are here, that you're taking time out of your night to, to learn about stuff. I'm sure in some way or another, um, if you haven't been affected by drug addiction or, or any some type of addiction, someone you do someone you know has. So um, yeah, I, I'm just really glad to be here. I'm trying to keep wrapping up. She's at 10 minutes. You're so I'm like, great. okay, I'm doing 10 minutes. You're doing great. So Thank you very much, Michelle. Thank you again, Michelle, for coming out and um, sharing your story. Because I think when we hear stories like that, it lessens the shame. You had a great point, and I saw it again and again being a counselor. Is um, You talked about self-medicating. Something. There's this hole. And people will self-medicate with drugs and alcohol. What, what happens is the very thing they're reaching out to self-medicate starts a snowball effect and life starts to unravel pretty quickly when addiction happens. And so if we thought we had problems when we started to self-medicate, the disease of addiction is a progressive disease. It will not leave you where it meets you. And that denial sometimes says, oh, it's just a phase. It's not a phase, if left unchecked, this can progress very, very quickly. And I saw that again and again, um, people that guilt and the shame. And so why I like having events like this is because I want to remove the stigma as much as possible. And Michelle, you're a perfect example. Probably not what we think of when we think of addiction. Probably not the face that comes to mind, is it? Probably not. But that is the face of addiction. Look around this room. That is the face of addiction. So I'm really glad that everybody came out tonight. If there's other questions uh, for Michelle, for Dr. Singla, for myself, we can field those now. Or if there's any comments, please feel free. Yes? Working with adults, um, mail order pharmacy. Mm -hmm. How much of that do you see? 
mail order pharmacy stuff because we, we work with kids. Yeah. And oh, I've got kids taking around credit card and ordering stuff online from Mexico and having it shipped to the house. Oh, yeah. Oh, well, I mean, yeah, I've seen everything. I've seen everything. You know, I've had patients come in and they dump bags of meds, you know, upon admission. And you're thinking, where are you getting all this stuff from? I, people get it off the internet. People doctor shop. Um, some of that doctor shopping is stopping with some of the um, state, regulations. state regulations, if you want to talk a little bit about that at all. Um, but yeah, people will go to great lengths to do it. Is it out there? Yes. Do people do it? Yes. Um, but again, I think that's where, there's three facets when I was in addiction that I taught people. One is honesty. You have to get honest. And I told my patients all the time, a half truth is a whole lie. They talk about a rigorous honesty in a 12-step program. Rigorous, you gotta get honest. And sometimes we don't wanna put it all on the table. The second thing is humility. Humility is saying I need help. It's that first step, it's surrendering that this is greater than me and I need help. Which if you're saying you need help, you should be open to receive counsel. I can't tell you the clients that I dealt with that came in the door loaded with pride wanting to tell me this is how I'm gonna do treatment. Okay, so that's a hallmark sign, the attitude of the heart. And the third thing is accountability. If you are truly in recovery and you're in a good treatment center that's going to point out you can't order off the internet anymore, you need to sign a release to your doctor who's prescribing Norco and write a letter of accountability because now the onus is on me. You can't use ignorance anymore. Once you become educated, the onus is on me now to tell my doctors, hey, I have a history of addiction. Please do not prescribe me addictive meds. Family members need to know that. So honesty, humility, and accountability. If you have those three things, you will get well. You will get well. Um, when people surrender and take responsibility, miracles happen. And so, yes, you can come up with all kinds of stories and creative ways of how people get this stuff, but the bottom line is, if you're gonna be honest, you're gonna come clean with that stuff and you're gonna be willing to be accountable and do life a little bit differently. But it's, it's hard to get there because, again, addiction is a habit that's been built up. It is a lot of times people's number one coping mechanism. This is how I do life. This is how I do emotions. This is how I do stress. This is how I do celebrations. I use substances. So when you talk about removing that, it doesn't, people don't just set it down. Sometimes you're like pulling it from them, you know? Um, but, but I have seen again and again, People get sober. People regain their lives. It sometimes is a long road. We shouldn't be discouraged if, you know, I've heard people say, well, treatment didn't work. They went to treatment. Well, again, your loved one might not have been ready for treatment because just because somebody goes to treatment doesn't mean they're in the action stage of change and are actually going to get honest, be humble, and be accountable. Sometimes that takes a couple of times, and that's okay. I've known people that people would have written off. You know, and if you read the AA book, many of those people, doctors wrote off. They're hopeless addicts and they should be locked up in a psych unit. Well, guess what? Those people recovered their lives. They recovered their sanity. They recovered their reputation. They recovered their livelihood and they became productive members of society. So sometimes the most hopeless case, never give up hope on anybody. Never give up hope on anybody um, because it, recovery is possible. Any other questions or comments? All right, well, thank you all for coming. Um, feel free to grab any of the brochures or to talk to anybody. And again, thanks so much for coming out. We really appreciate it.